presentation or a conference. And so I always felt like, oh, that's so nice. Mm -hmm. They would say, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. So-and-so. And they'd introduce the person. They'd be like, Dr. So-and-so, you have the floor. Like, how, how formal is that? That's so nice. I am the opposite of formal. But that's okay. How's it going? Good. It's good to see all of you again. Thank you for being here. I know you all laugh at that because there's like a quiz to take, but you know, <laughs> you can leave after the quiz. Uh, today's path analysis. Believe it or not, you've been doing path analysis. It may not feel like it, but you were doing path analysis. What's a saturated model? All the stuff gets estimated. All the stuff gets estimated. It, on, and, and on model, in, in the homework, which model was the saturated model? Three. Model 3, right? Did you find that model 3 fit the best? Yeah. yeah. That, what does it mean if the saturated model fits the best? What's that? Did you? Yeah, sorry, huh? No? Oh, she's asking if I really found that model 3 was the best. And I, thought I, did. I found model 3 was the best. You'll get your homework back and you'll have a chance to change it. Does it help? having a chance to fail and then succeed yes. afterwards, I hope. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want you to fail, but I do think that the trial, the multiple trials, I don't want to penalize you for it. You know, it's tough. Yes, Dad. No. Say that again? <laughs> multiple choice for This is where, like, some of the quizzes will be complete, or I try to give you all the points. All right? So you don't know when those will be, but uh, I just, I just, I feel like you're doing the work, the reading, and so forth. And was this quiz hard? Yeah, yes and no. I know that when I grab the quiz, I, I pull up the chapter, and I, I skim through it again, but I usually try to pick the topical sections of a headline or two. Most of these questions came out of one section in the chapter uh, this week, so that's where I grabbed them from. But they were trying to be big picture ideas. Anyway, about the, the homework and about the uh, saturated models. So saturated models are what we're working with. When we start to assume multivariate normal distributions, there's a very obvious and clear saturated model, right? It's estimate everything. And every single path analysis, every single structural equation model, every single CFA model that you fit, where you assume the multi multivariate normal somewhere has that, right? If you don't have multivariate normal, it's not there, it's different. So hold, up, hold that for later, that's later on in the class. In fact, we devote semesters to that to some of those topics, one of which is item response theory. Um, but multivariate normal at least provides a nice framework to talk about model fit, model assessment, and so forth. So let's talk logic of, of, of model comparisons, right? In your Levon output, there are two, like the two log likelihoods that come up, right? One is labeled H0, one is labeled H1, right? H0 kind of looks like a null hypothesis. H1 looks like an alternative hypothesis, or at least that's what it's supposed to be. So, of those two, which one would be the saturated model? H1. Why is it H1? Alternative models in a nested model setting always have to have more parameters. And there are no more parameters in a saturated model, right? You can only have equal to, you can't have more than. Actually, that's something we're going to talk about today. So when you're doing multivariate normal data, uh, not data, assumptions, when you have multivariate normal assumptions trickling through, in this case, it's error terms. Uh, when we get to factors, it's factors and error terms. And I guess there's one other assumption is that you have one class. If you put a mixture model on it, it gets even worse. But anyway, when you have this setup, the most number of parameters you can do with one class, the multivariate normal assumptions trickling through is the saturated model. So that makes it the alternative. That makes your model the null. Okay. And the, the goal in all of this in terms of likelihood ratio testing or in terms of the model fit that we talked about last week is you want your model to fit as well as the saturated model. You can never beat the saturated model. Saturated model is the pinnacle, right? But if you do as well as the saturated model, then your model is said to fit and your hypotheses are plausible. Right? And that's it, it essentially. Our game is all about testing, testing hypotheses. And 
The path analysis we're going to see today are all about uh, hypotheses with observed variables, very much like linear regression would have. Uh, but when we get to next week, con conditional on me getting through class today. Sorry, i got to fix in the back of my chair here. Templin will fall off. Someone else will have to leave class. Ah, forget it. I'll just take my chances. Um, when we get to next week, we'll, we'll find that we'll be making hypotheses about whether or not like a survey measures one factor. Right? And that's the same type of deal. Does the survey measure one factor? If it does, it should follow. Our data should look like a structure that should fit the, the alternative model, the unstructured model, right? Or, or saturated. Joe, do you have any questions for me before we begin? Guidance, big picture, what's the meaning of life? What should I have for dinner? Anything. It's like Reddit, ask me anything. Yeah. So when you do the likelihood ratio test mm -hmm. uh, in the bind, do you need to, does it matter which model you enter first? I don't think it should. Uh, but one way that you can always tell is the model that's, uh, you should know which model has more parameters, and that should be the one that has uh, the, it's the alternative when you're trying to compare two models itself. This is the ANOVA statement you're talking about? Yeah. I've never, I realized that as I got class stuff prepared, I, uh, I got enough Levon trial and error to try it so that I knew what the answer was so it would work. I never tried what happens if. Um, so I, it would be interesting. But, um, in theory, what could happen if it, if it did matter, you'd see a negative chi-square, and that should never happen. Or negative degrees of freedom, that should never happen. So. Now, chi-squares can't be negative, just for the heads up. You've probably heard that before, but um, it's easy to get lost things. That's a good question. Thank you, Bridget. Other questions? What should I have for dinner tonight? Chicken. Chicken, bread. What beer should I have? <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> yes, lots of it. Yeah, no, it's uh, usually after class you'll find me somewhere in town. <laughs> I don't usually leave town. <laughs> All right, let's talk about path analysis here. Here's the questions I'm trying to focus on in today's lecture. Uh, what distinguishes the label path models from something that would be considered multivariate regression? Right. Have you seen multivariate regression? Let me ask you that. It's not very common. You always hear of, you may have heard of MANOVA. I know I talked about multivariate analysis of variance, but multivariate regression doesn't show up probably because we can't just say it like an acronym, like mm, regression. Um, so anyway, we're going to start with that one, but we'll talk about what distinguishes them. Uh, what are the identification conditions for path models? What? I guess I should step up. What's identification in fir the first place? You probably know what that is in terms of like your driver's license. Yeah, we'll figure that out. Uh, when we get into these multivariate models, uh, the world changes. It's, it's kind of like, uh, and actually it's, the parallel is very true, although we can have multiple dimensions. Um, have any of you been in, in a little small plane before? Or flown? Like, so I remember the first time I was in a small plane, uh, I love like I love anything with an engine. I pretty much love. That's the type of person I am. I enjoy, you know, that thing. So flying was pretty much awesome for me. Driving, you know, I really enjoy. But um, you know, when you're driving, you're pretty much in two dimensions, right? You look left, you look right. When you get into a plane, I remember taking off. This is in Sacramento, California. And it was like a like get to know this small little airport day, and we're taking off, and the pilot's like, "Where was that other plane?" And he's looking up for it, right? It's like, oh yeah, that's right. We have to now look in multiple planes. There's multiple things that can happen in a multivariate sense that didn't happen when you were in this regular regression sense. Every regression model that you've ever run is identified, for instance. So therefore, we never talk about it. Every regression model that you've ever run with one vari dependent variable is saturated. We estimated its only variance or residual variance. Right? It's estimated. So it's saturated. We never worry about model fit because it fits perfectly. So these are the things that happen when you start to go from one variable in, a, in an analysis to multiple variables all at once. And so path analysis is multiple regressions all at once. So identification becomes part of the issue. Right, there are ways to specify models that cannot possibly work. Um, and they happen fairly frequently. Yeah, we'll see that. All right, the next uh, question is, this is overkill from the, qui overkill from the quiz. What is an indirect effect? 
What is a total effect? And then finally, what are standardized coefficients? So we could have had uh, indirect and total effects we never really had in univariate regression. We certainly had direct effects, what we're going to call direct effects. And then standardized coefficients we did have in, in univariate regression, but they are all the more prevalent now. So we're just going to keep moving forward with all these. And again, just like uh, last week's class and the week before, where we're trying to set up things that seem a little esoteric, but they're with us always, all of these things continue throughout the rest of the lecture. Every single week, we could think about identification. We could think about uh, direct effects. We would talk about standardized coefficients. All of that stuff shows up. Uh, and then just the, the general knowledge is at top. So are you, are you happy? Is this it? Like this is the, the first lecture of the rest of this class. No. <laughs> All those, those throwaway statements, or, you know, coach speak or whatever. This is also the worst lecture you'll have this afternoon. We're going to start with multivariate regression, and then we'll end up with this thing. Remember that from last week? Whoa, that's the analysis. Uh, and we're along the way, we'll talk about standardized coefficients. Model modification, which we sort of talked about before, but didn't really. Uh, and then direct, in, direct and indirect effects. And then we sort of dive into what uh, estimation we have to worry about and uh, types of variables. So again, like last week, we sort of started with this example. We have this data from Pajares and Miller in 1994. It's a paper. I believe I put the paper in the readings folder. I never, it was one of the optional readings for the class. But if you want to read how to report on a path analysis, I thought that was a good example. Um, you know, there's, there's always ways to nitpick. Nothing's perfect, so I could always nitpick this or that, and it probably becomes the way that Templin would do it rather than somebody else. But I thought it was a pretty nice example of, of a nice way to report it. So if you find yourself with a path analysis and like to write it up, that's a good example to look at. The homework this week also will involve that. So you'll, you'll take a look at a paper, you'll read a paper, and you're going to have to replicate their path analysis with data that is generated based on their results. So Anyway, I have uh, from this, there were uh, 350 undergraduates in their sample, 229 men, uh, women, 121 men. 10% of the variables were missing completely at random. Remember missing completely at random? That means I literally, for every number in this data set, 350 times the number of variables I had, I drew a random number. If between 0 and 1, if that number was less than 10, I deleted the data. If not, I kept it. So it's completely random. There's nothing about the, the analysis that would be otherwise. And here are the variables. Gender is the, an observed variable, male and female. Uh, I have math self-efficacy, a scale. Perceived usefulness of math, a scale. Math anxiety, a scale. Math self-concept, a scale. Prior experience at the high school level, it's self-reported, but that should be observable, right? Which is number of courses that you've taken in high school on mathematics. Uh, prior experience at the college level, which is number of courses you took in college, or actually this is credit hours, excuse me, credit hours in college. So again, it's self-reported, but it is, it should be something that's um, directly observable, should we have a transcript. And uh, math performance. And I make a note of this, okay, so this, this right here was observable, we'll call it observable today, this and this. These three things are things that we can observe directly about a person. We don't have to create a scale about. Everything else we're creating a scale. Well, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Five scales. So really to do this analysis the proper way, and I'll say proper uh, from a sense of that what this class is all about, we would actually need a path analysis that doesn't uh, do what we're about to do, which is treat each of these as measured without error. Like they're observable as well too. All right. So in today's lecture, uh, we're going to do what everybody publishes on, but we should never, really never do, which is um, we're going to treat something like math self-efficacy as an observed variable. And what did we observe? We observed their test score. Uh, how did we figure that out? We added up the items. Uh, for those of you who may know me a little bit, that I have a nice name for that. It's called the Add Stuff Up Model, ASU. I usually substitute the S for a, a word of a little bit more choice, depending on which company I'm in. But teaching, I should be professional, and I say add stuff up. Um, it, believe it or not, when you add things together, you are implying a very specific model about your data. Nobody ever told you that, but you're implying that. And given what we just learned last night, last week, last night, those of you who did your homework last night, I feel like I did too. Uh, <laughs> those, the, 
the, the four different models that you fit, you were sort of making assumptions about things and, and testing them. If adding things up makes assumptions about data, doesn't it there go that we should be able to test it against something? Let's see, This is why we would normally want to take these and put them into a context where we would fit measurement models for each of these then jointly and then put it into a larger structural equation model together. We're not yet, and that's because of several reasons. I had a hard time finding path analyses in education or social sciences that didn't do this when I looked for an example to, to pull for this. Uh, but also, um, I, I try to do one thing at a time. Even if that thing's ridiculous, like newton raphson or multivariate normal or all that stuff that goes with it, um, I still, one thing at a time, the, the one thing this time is multiple regression equations simultaneously, okay? Cool, but um, if you ever bring this to me, if you ever say, Templin, I need your help with the path analysis or better yet, I'm doing this for my dissertation or and I'll say, you know what I'm going to say if you add things up, right? Which is, did you test whether you could add them up? Did you test that hypothesis? Should you? Yeah. So anyway, so here's the big model. Uh, each of these uh, lines that you see here represents a direct effect. And if you were to roughly translate that, that really is the schematic diagram of a regression equation, right? We talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but where the arrow ends means this thing is a dependent variable, right? So high school math experience is being predicted by where the arrow, the line where the arrow begins, that variable, which is gender. So what the, 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 the arrows really are sort of trying to tell are the beta weights for that effect, that direct effect itself. If I took high school math experience then by itself, high school, I think we say HSE is what we call it, it would be equal to a linear regression. We have an intercept plus a slope times gender plus error. And what you'll see in my equations throughout all of this class is because we have multiple dependent variables in these, I take each of these terms and superscript them with what they're predicting. Because we'll have more than one intercept, we'll have more than one slope, we'll have one more, more than one residual uh, term itself. So what you'll see is this is beta 0 HSE, beta 1 HSE, and actually I call this beta G, what's predicting it, times beta uh, to the HSE. What's the, the subscript is what's what this beta weight is multiplying, the superscript is what it's predicting. We're running out of symbols eventually, right? So it's hard to keep it all together. A lot of times I would say this is error for the prediction of high school experience. So at this beta weight right here is the, predict the, uh, the strength of the relationship of gender on high school experience. That's kind of how we think of that. And what this little, er this little arrow right here represents is essentially our sigma squared, or our error, sigma squared error, our residual variance. You're now by now familiar with that term, I take it. Questions about it, what does it mean? How much we vary and how our prediction is off, right? from it. But this, this I usually give a colon and call give it the dependent variable it's for. Okay. So the path diagram itself takes care of only some of the parameters of the model. And that's why I'd like to say this is a model implied by it. It is not a model. Uh, this is one of the things that if you talk to, some of you have the, the privilege of working with my wife. Uh, if you talk to her, we differ about this. Um, I, I always like to joke around and say like square plus square does not equal square or circle plus square doesn't equal triangle. Or there's all sorts of creative ways people make these diagrams. And really they're not models. Model, a model would have every term in the equation listed here. We would call it isomorphic, right? We'd be able to say everything that's there shows up here somewhere and therefore we can sort of symbolically represent everything in the model itself, kind of in a logic sense. For us, this is a diagram representing what's supposed to be a model. It's not entirely the case a model. All right. So remember that uh, when, when someone throws this up on the board, if, if, or better yet, if, you're, if I'm in your defense and you're saying this is my model, I'll be like, nah, not a model. I don't see a plus. I don't see a square. My algebra doesn't work with squares and cir circles and triangles and arrows and stuff. So. Anyway, gotta, I feel like you got to know both things. But yes, it is nice to see this. It sort of represents it. 
So each of the lines represents a direct effect. Every dashed line represents a residual variance. And in this analysis, how many uh, dependent variables do we have then? There are six. You can pick them out by the dashed lines, right? Every, every regression line has a residual term. Every residual term has a variance to it. And that's what's represented here. So there we have all the dashed lines, all six of them. Themselves. Okay. So, big picture. Um, in path analyses that you typically read about in literature, we take, make this assumption that um, th it says the variables. These are the residual variables. We make the uh, assumption that residuals, these E terms for each of these, follow a multivariate normal distribution. Right. So what that really means is when we put it all together, the other way we could talk about it is if, if we don't have residual, if we don't have the word residual here, what we can say is our data or the dependent variables, the DVs in our analysis, follow something called a conditional multivariate normal distribution. Right, that's different than just a multivariate normal distribution. It says once you control for all the prediction that you're doing, then you have this multivariate normal. So y given x is multivariate normal, right? That is a very different thing than saying y by itself is, a multivari is multivariate normal, right? The latter would say things like, well, if you don't have no normal data, you shouldn't do this analysis. Or it would seek you to say, well, let me see if I can try to transform my data to make it normal, right? That's not what we want to do. We can't do that because if we transform our data, our data don't have the assumption of norm multivariate normality. In fact, our data themselves just exist. It's once we start putting the error terms assumptions in, we make these assumptions about data. So what we're getting at here is if, uh, if you ever heard someone say, well, we need to transform our data, I, I really hate that. Uh, if I give you, can we, I'm going to go on a topic. I feel like I need, I have your attention. I'll tell you why. We talked before about multivariate normal. Uh, what's a multivariate normal with, with, uh, with one variable? It's a univariate normal. So path analysis with one variable is something we call like a regression or ANOVA. Right? So anything that's multivariate normal should be univariate normal. That's just the way things work. With me? So if that's the case, if I had a regression line that said y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 g plus e, right? So this is the gender. Now gender is either 0 or 1, right? I've seen people say, oh, but y has to be normal, so I'm going to go transform y. But this is, this is regression approaches like we talk about with a analysis of variance. Right, so if we were to look at y itself, like this is the, the range of y, if we were to draw distributions for it, what this is telling us is that people who are where g is 0 may have a beta 0, something like right here. Right, and then they will have an error around their distribution that would be normal. And people who uh, have g equals 1, maybe beta 1 is positive, so beta 0 plus plus beta 1 gives you their mean, and that looks like their data. And if we had equal numbers of people in each group, we could just take off, we, if we didn't do our analysis, our data would look like that. Would definitely not look normal. It would look bimodal, it'd look like a camel, right? Today's Wednesday, sorry. <laughs> Someone, get, anybody get that joke? <laughs> Anyone wanna say it? There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I you know I hear that's popular with the, the younger generation. Um, no, not much younger. Uh, well, my daughter likes it. <laughs> they're, they're they're literally going to be like who runs the show in a while. I'm gonna, uh, sorry, sorry. Well, first. Oh, that's true. That's true. All right, we're we're, we're in that spot where eight, you know like like upper limits of longevity is still going up. So the people running it now are going to run it longer, and then no. Just kidding. Anyway, yes, so this is your data, and what happens when you try to normalize it through a transformation? Let's just go back to that. All right, basically your transformation, whatever you apply, really wants to take that thing and move it that way, and take that thing and move it that way. All right, and if you move those things in to together, what happens to your effects? All right, if you, if, you, if you go do a transformation, maybe it's a square root, or maybe it's a log, or maybe it's that, you get data that look like this now, you have an effect here, an effect here, the mean difference is much smaller. The transformation just shrunk your effect size. 
And you didn't need it in the first place because even if your data met these assumptions, you wouldn't have to transfer, you know, you, you would find, you, sorry, even if, even though Y didn't meet the normality assumption. So, sorry, backing up on my slides, conditional, conditionally normal, meaning that once you predict things, you have a normal distribution, okay? I say that, I mean it very passionately. You wouldn't believe the number of times I see it wrong, not from most people who are in our classes, it's the people who teach these classes. I was just on a uh, NSF review panel where, you know, National Science Foundation, fantastic. This is where, you know, we're supposed to be doing, they're supposed to fund the top, they only, you know, they have a really risky portfolio, but they have people getting this basic stuff wrong that are in our field. And it's just, we can't, can't go on that way. So there, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. So don't transform your data, first of all, because what ends up happening is the effects you're looking for, and it's not necessary. Anyway, our models are conditional multivariate normal. If they're not conditional multivariate normal, you can still use them. You just have to switch the distributional assumption. That takes a little, that's easier said than done, but we will get there eventually. But our, um, what we're doing is specifying a series of simultaneous regression equations, right? And when we set up that model, we had six regression equations from our previous slide, right here, each with a number of dependent variables. Those specific regression equations are our hypothesis about our data, but more than that, they specify a very specific version of a covariance matrix. So if you have multivariate normal or conditionally multivariate normal data, that covariance matrix that we're talking about. Remember, that's the thing you've been playing with, model three is the saturated model. This model itself gives you something that looks different than the saturated model. You're not estimating everything. You're estimating something that should have covariances where some are big and some are small and so forth. What the covariances are, I actually shield you from in this lecture. If you read, uh, if you take a look at the Kaplan book, uh, which is an optional reading, you can see it in matrices. And some of my previous versions of teaching this class, I really dove into those more. I, I really, I, I find I lose the class at that point, but they're archived, they're archived on my website. If you want to take a look at like the UGA version of this slide, there was like, I, I think I spent four weeks on path analysis because it was all matrices. And who wants to do that anyway, right? But the bigger picture, if you can understand with me, is when you specify a model, you specify hypotheses, they lead to a covariance matrix. And now once you have a covariance matrix, you're back in the same setup that you were with, with homework two. Right? You can compare and contrast that covariance matrix with the alternative or the saturated covariance matrix, right? To see if it fits. And if it fits, then you're good. You can talk about your model. If not, you've got to start adding things usually. Okay. So much like MANOVA and multi-level models, the key to doing all this is finding this effective approximation of the saturated model covariance matrix. It's easier said than done, like I keep saying. Uh, the art is to sort of come up with one that fits well enough to report, but then again um, allows you to, uh, to believe the results. You know, the more that you tinker with your model, the less likely it is to generalize to something that might be more stable. So we've got this delicate balance of doing repeated types of tests, which end up bringing up more type 1 error rates and so forth. Um, finding spurious findings, but then at the same time, we have to be beholden to model fit to be able to describe anything that results happen. So it's a big picture work for you, hopefully. Okay, sorry for my handwriting. Here we go, we're gonna start with multivariate regression. Multivariate regression is regression with two variables. So I picked two, I picked uh, the performance on the 20 item test at the end of the math, uh, the, the study. I'm predicting it with high school uh, experience and college experience. ACSL is a number of courses in high school that you took. CC is college credit hour experience. So note they're on a different scale. Right? In high school you took, you know, uh, I think most of us, if you went to school relatively recently, I believe math was required all four years of high school. Is anybody who does, works with, anybody know this? I don't know. I'm trying to remember my high school. I don't think I took math my senior year, so back in the dark ages, we only had like three years. Yeah. Um, so this is gonna be fairly common, but you'll see numbers from one, zero to four, essentially. How many high school courses did you take? You might, I guess you may have taken five if you had a, a high school that offered something that you could take simultaneously with something else. Um, 
Whereas college credit hours, each math course in college had between, I think, what, three and five hours of credit? I think all the ones I took had five. I don't know what we do here, but, uh, you know. So even if you took, you know, and, de and depending on the major that you took, you may have taken no math classes, or you may have taken math classes completely, right? If you're in mathematics or in engineering or in some type of STEM discipline, you typically take a little bit more math. Um, so... Uh, assuming, of course, you didn't test out of them in high school or something along those lines. But anyway, I'm trying to get you to think each of the scales of the variables in a, in a regression matter, and it still matters in path analysis, right? So each of these things show up. I'm foreshadowing the use of standardized coefficients, really. Um, then, so that's that's performance. Then I, I go and I take use your your a person's perceived usefulness of, of mathematics. Believe me, I actually did. I had a very low perception of the usefulness of mathematics back in high school. It went up through the roof when I took a stat course. I took a stat course to get out of taking calculus. I was bad at math, and uh, I was like, "Wow, what? there's a there's a there's a reason we do math now." <laughs> like all of a sudden, made sense to me, which, you know, where it didn't before. I don't know. Made sense why we were doing it and pursuing it. So it was it was an interesting way. But my perceived usefulness changed radically. But what we're trying to do is say that a person's perceived usefulness is dependent on how many courses uh, they've taken, both in high school and college. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing, you know, this, this is analysis one and this is analysis two, but putting this in this broader framework, we're going to do these analyses simultaneously. Simultaneous analyses allow us several wonderful features. Number one, if we have missing data, uh, the missing data assumptions of missing at random come into play. So if somebody is missing a score on only one of these variables, we can still use the other variable's data. And because we're doing this in the analysis all at once, we actually, each of the parameters and each of the, the outcomes in the, ver in the model itself are being estimated jointly, meaning they're borrowing information from each other, right, statistically. There's a, it's really complicated, but there's ways that you could say how parameters are related to each other, and that parameter relationship in the same model means they, you can do all things at once and get a little bit better precision by doing it at once. So that's where we would go. Practically speaking, there won't be a lot of difference in, in our analysis doing this with two at once rather than just doing two separate models. But we're going to do two, okay? All right. So let's take a look at our error terms. Those error terms, uh, rather than having one, we now have two. So we can take those errors and say that they follow a multivariate normal distribution. We saw that last week with the empty model, right? We had these Example, we have these two variables, and we, we have their error terms, and we said they follow this multivariate normal distribution. Our empty model for the error uh, is that we have each of the error terms as a zero mean. That's like what we would assume in a regular univariate regression. Each error term has a residual variance, just like we would have in a univariate regression. But then the term that is unlike the univariate regression, the covariance shows up. That is the covariance in the residual between uh, performance and usefulness. It's an odd thing to describe or to interpret, but think of it this way, right? Once we get, think of what E stands for, for each of these, right? E is the difference between what we predict and what we observe, right? So if we have a very big E, it means we're very off in our prediction and we're, we're too low, right? And we have very, if we have a very small or close to zero E, it means we're right on in our prediction. So the more, Variance we observe means we have more bigger E's. Our prediction is worse. The smaller our variance that we observe in terms of uh, residual variance, the smaller, uh, the better our prediction is. Um, similarly, once we have two of these, we basically are saying how far, how off are we in on both variables, right? So if this thing is positive, it would indicate a positive correlation between our residuals. That's fine. We could. It's modeled. It's. It's. it's sometimes you talk about. Things like that, we don't want to have a zero. We want to have a zero correlation. This is fine. We have a, a term for it in the model. That just means that when one term is off, the other term is off, right? If it's positive, it means the higher one term gets in terms of error. The more off we are in one prediction, the more off we are in the same direction in the other prediction. If it's negative, it's the flip. The more off we are positively on one, the more negative our prediction is on the other, right? Too low versus too high of prediction. But we often don't interpret this term. In fact, most of the time, the residual covariances are um, throwaway parameters. They're what makes the model fit. Right? They don't, 
really hurt us in terms of model. They're not really an assumption. There's just something we could say, okay, yeah, there's residual covariance. We're predicting multiple things at once. It's likely to be the case, right? We're not off on, we're, we're off on a little bit for everybody. So that is the difference between multivariate regression, univariate regression is that one term. Here is a path diagram for the multivariate regression itself. This is now going to use a little bit more of the terminology. Here we have mathematics performance. This is our first dependent variable. Mathematics usefulness, that's our second. We can tell they're dependent variables because we have our dashed lines themselves. Sometimes you'll see uh, this is supposed to be an arrow here. Double-headed arrows. These are called um, undirected arcs sometimes, undirected paths. What it really means is that these two things are set to covary. That's in opposition to just a line with one arrow on it, which is a direct effect, which says the thing before the uh, the thing that starts the line is predicting the thing that ends the line. Or when we build up <clears throat> the argument, if we could if we could have a causal like, experimental process, we could say manipulating the thing at the beginning of the arrow led to changes in the thing at the end of the arrow. But that's essentially the difference between direct effect and then kind of a double-headed arrow, an undirected arc. They we're saying, yeah, they're correlated. We don't know which one causes the other. We just know that they're correlated. I say the, cause, the, the C word causality quite a bit here. Causality is like the ideal, right? We never actually get to cause causality. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the plausible outcomes if your model fits. Oh, yeah, yeah, what I said caused the things. But because you haven't if you don't have experimental data and a good manipulation and random assignment and all the things that would go into your basic experimental design that you think about, causality is really difficult to infer. Instead, you can rule it out, but you can never, you can never say it. So, anyway, how are we doing? Am I running over in circles so far? So there's your dependent variables. Sorry to run in circles. Um, over here are independent variables. So here's high school math experience. You've got the slope predicting performance and the slope predicting usefulness as a direct effect. College math experience has a slope predicting performance and slope predicting usefulness. Now, anything predicted in the analysis is something called an endogenous variable. Right? I always think of those as variables in the model. Right? endogenous. So here, mathematics performance, mathematics usefulness are endogenous variables. And one easy way to tell endogenous variables, if you're given like output from Levon or some other program, is to, to figure out what where the residual variances are. Right? If you have a residual variance, you had to had predicted that thing. The prediction itself implies that thing is a endogenous variable, right? So um, the, uh, as opposed to exogenous variables. So here we've got high school math experience and college math experiences as being exogenous, which, is, which basically says they're not part of the prediction of the model itself. Now, these terms may have variances and covariances. Right, and here in this model, I'm actually putting them in the, the document, right? So perhaps there's a variance to high school math experience, a variance to college math experience, and a covariance between them. That's fine. That's like saying that's a saturated model for those parts, right? Which is basically saying, yeah, they vary and they co-vary, but we're not going to describe why they do. We just take it that they do and put that into our analysis itself. So that's a l also a little bit different from our typical regression analysis is that if we, if we think of the nature of a saturated model, we could take parts of our path analysis, and here we've got four variables. We could say, oh yeah, these two things, these are really exogenous. I don't really need to predict them, so I'm going to make that two by two covariance matrix between them saturated. I'm going to estimate both variances and the residual, or both residual variance and the covariance of it. And then over in the other side, I'm going to make that thing based on this model itself, the, the covariance for it. So everything else part of it. So exogenous variables actually can come into our analysis as part of the likelihood. We could estimate those terms just like we would in a saturated model. Pretty cool, huh? So, anyway, how are we doing? Questions? I get a sense nobody thinks that's as cool as I do. That's all right. I'm going to pause. It looks like we have hair bands up here. Who would like to ask a question for a used hair band? <laughs> it's gross, right? 
Don't make me open the drawer. I have chalk. Anyone want to ask a question for a piece of chalk? Try to raffle off things. So far, okay? Cool. All right, so endogenous variables are variables in the model. Their variability is being explained by something. Exogenous variables are variables that have variability that may or may not be in the likelihood. We may choose to not have them in our model likelihood itself. That's fine. Um, but the variability, the bigger picture is the variability is not explained. It's just is, right? We don't explain why people have variation in their high school math experience. It just happens. Um, now note, in this definition, anything that's an endogenous variable can also predict other endogenous variables, right? It didn't say anything about prediction. It just said, is your variance explained? So that's where you see in our big path model, we actually have endogenous variables, like high school math experience. That's an endogenous variable. It's predicting math performance. That's a variable predicting another one. And actually, that's the answer to the first question before of, of the class. Where we draw the line between multivariate regression and path analysis is, is, the, is the question, can dependent variables predict other dependent variables? That's it. Right? That one little distinction, that one little caveat, takes us from being able to estimate this with regression software and switches it over to making the likelihood a little bit more complicated and making a little bit more specialized software be need for, needed for it. Weird, huh? But that's it. So, we've got the labeling of the variables. So how does this work um, with our um, variables and Levon? Uh, Levon puts the exogenous variables into the likelihood function. Right? So that basically says, if you've got endogenous variables and exogenous, count up all of them. How many variables do you have? Four. Just like we had in homework, four measurements. So our covariance matrix was size four by four. We had a mean vector as well. That mean vector is actually gets kind of replaced by our predictions, actually. But our mean vector is there. Our covariance matrix is there. Um, the problem with that, by default, is that if your variables aren't multivariate normal, and it, they use, you use a multivariate normal likelihood for it, you may get biased est estimates. Right? If, like gender, once we put gender into an analysis, believe it or not, Levon will put it into the likelihood and treat it as, it's, as, it's, as if it's normally distributed. And, and here I'm talking more biological sex, I guess. I think the word gender is probably dating where I learned the term. But you know, we may not think of it as the gender affiliation or something along those lines. It's actually your chromosomal sex. Um, this, um, this variable clearly can't be normally distributed because it's categorical. There's two categories to it, right? Just because I'm man doesn't make me three standard deviations below the mean in gender. Right? It just doesn't quite work that way, right? But that's, that's kind of what it's happening. And so there's, this actually stumbles into a bigger picture debate that this isn't really discussed or talked about or known very well in a lot of the books. But you'll see books, and I don't think Klein says this. Uh, actually, he might. Check that. He might say this in the chapters that you need to have multivariate normal data to do path analysis. And really, it's not the case. You just have to make sure that the variables that aren't multivariate normal or can't be don't show up as part of the likelihood. Levon, though, unfortunately, you don't get to make that choice. If you're using M+, you do get to make that choice. Um, but we'll, we'll just pretend that that's fine for right now. The results aren't that much different, but eventually it starts to hurt us as we go along. But, whoa, that's not cool. Levon, uh, what we end up doing is uh, we could add a, a fixed x equal fixed dot x equals true, and you'll see in my my equations that SEM function that I use, where I put the model syntax and there's a bunch of commas and other things. One of those other things is fixed dot x equals true, and that tries to make it the impact of putting these variables in the likelihood a little bit smaller. But um, anyway, we'll end up doing this explicitly in the syntax from now on and, and turning the, that option off. We'll just remove it from the title. And by explicitly, let me show you this syntax here. Let's see, this is make it a little bit better. better. The Levon syntax, uh, I put try to put everything from that multivariate normal into the syntax that you see here. So at first, you have our regression equations uh, right up here. I can't not draw now, whoops, right here. Sorry, this gets really small. But performance and usefulness is on the other side of a single tilde. 
Right? The single tilde means is predicted by, as opposed to the double tilde, which says covaries with. Right? The difference sounds like it's pretty similar, but it's the difference between a straight arrow and one with two arrow, two, 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 oh, sorry, a line with one arrow and a line with two. Right? So that's what that is. In our model, we have beta zeros or intercepts for each variable. Levon has syntax for that. That's where the tilde one shows up. You use this to constrain the mean for model four in homework. And if you didn't, there's a hint. So it'll, it'll get back to you and you can fix it and we'll work, you, you can always work with me. But um, those are the means for the endogenous, or the intercepts for the endogenous variables. And you'll note they're not means anymore because they're, they show up as conditional values, right? They are now interpreted as the expected or the predicted value when all the other predictors are equal to zero. Right, so they're no longer overall marginal means, they're conditional means, essentially. Means when all the predictors are zero. And then finally, the residual variances between both of the um, endogenous variables, that's where the double tilde shows up. Right? So perf double tilde perf and use double tilde use says I want to estimate the variance between each of these things. Perf double tilde use says put the covariance between those in. So that is all the endogenous side. For the exogenous side, we have the same things. The only difference on the exogenous side is we do not have the predicted values that we had before. Okay, we're not predicting those. We don't want to put a single tilde. What we basically are saying is we are estimating the mean for each of these values, so single tilde with a 1 afterwards, the variance for each of these values, and the covariance between them. All right, so that does just what you did in the saturated model before, but that each of these bits of the syntax are giving you access to all the model parameters. Now, technically speaking, to run this analysis, all you need are the first two, two things under the X up here. Everything else is by default turned on. But when you start running path analyses, I find it's a good habit to get into specifying everything that's there, because sometimes things that you don't want to be there show up. And actually, we're going to see that when we come back from break. So let's take a break for 10 minutes, come back, and we will talk more about how to get Levon to work with all of this.